church tonight. Would you let me church? Man, yes. I also want to welcome our folks with uh, Facebook, through Facebook and uh, YouTube as well. Welcome in the name of the Lord tonight. And we're going to be looking at some very, very important uh, issues where the Christian believer is concerned. Um, my brother Peter was here. Some of you remember my brother Peter. He was here some Sunday morning. I honestly can't remember. It had to be at least a couple of months ago, three, maybe three months, three months ago. And I remember him talking about going to the gymnasium and going through all the exercises and everybody else that was there. And, and he forgot to bring that particular point. At the end of all that, God bless Peter if he's watching. And what he, he neglected to, to say was that I cannot exercise for somebody else. That's right. How many wish that was possible? That, in other words, somebody else exercise for you and you lose the weight. How many think if you invent that, let me know I want to sign up, okay? I just want to make sure I get none of it. Or you can't exercise for someone else, nor can someone else exercise for you. One thing about living for Jesus Christ, no one can live for Jesus on your behalf. No one can be a believer on your behalf. No one can replace the personal responsibility of a believer to exercise his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ in a thing called Christianity. Now, how many understand that when you're in high school, elementary school, wherever you might be, or in college, and you want to join up, say, the basketball team or the football team or the hockey team, the soccer team, they all have their own little uh, pieces of equipment, especially football. I mean, you've got to they have the helmets, the, you know, all, all the equipment. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about? And so the job of the school is to provide for you that equipment. But how many know that the coach is not going to sit there and put it on you and play the game for you? And you just stand there for nice pictures. <laughs> in other words, beloved, nobody can hitchhike their way to heaven. No one can piggyback to victory. No one can substitute for your own personal walk with God. Are you getting this tonight? Yes. Because we individually have our own battles to fight. We have our individual battles to fight. You don't know the battles that I have been going through, and I don't know yours. It's not that we're impervious, indifferent, or careless about other people's demise and problems, but it's not my world. My world is not your world. And so God, knowing our individual personal needs, designed life for us so that we can assume personal responsibility. Now let's give you a bit of a uh, a bit of a parallel here. The school, for instance, will provide for you the equipment. Okay, let's just say you want to be playing football. Not you, Mary, I don't think it'll work out this year. You may try again next year, but I don't think so. Anyway, so let's just say you go to the university and you want to play football. So the job of the, of the school, the responsibility of the school, is to provide the equipment for you, right? That's, I guess, it's, I guess it's the way it is. The church, our responsibility as pastors, is to provide spiritual equipment for you. But we can't wear it for you. We can't wear it and use it on your behalf. We can only be an example for you how we've used our equipment and how we've been able to put our equipment on and fight the good fight. So that's why the Apostle Paul said repeatedly, what you've seen in me, what you've heard from me, what you've learned from me, that do. Monkey see, monkey do. So 
learn by other people's example. It's called model believing. Model leadership is the best teacher. And even greater than that is personal experience. So, as we go to Ephesians chapter 6 again tonight, keep in mind what I've just shared with you about the personal responsibility. So we're into chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 10, beginning. Finally, brethren, so we're in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. And here's what it says. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If you're going to play football, be a, a strong player. To be a water boy at the football game, you don't need the equipment. Is that right? You're going to be even the equipment provider or equipment carrier, courier, you don't have to wear it and be involved. But when he says finally, that's not in conclusion, but he's saying to bring this to a closure, to bring this to an understanding. He said, I need for you to be strong in the Lord, regardless of what life throws your way. And how many know that life can throw you some curveballs sometimes and some pretty bad experiences in life, especially when they hit you, you're totally unexpected. You know, you totally don't expect it. So he says, there is a way, by the way, he's saying here that regardless, whether it's your job site, whether it's your home, your marriage relationship, no matter where you are in life, God provides energy. He provides strength. He provides not only the equipment, but he provides incentive. See, Jameson is looking at going to Liberty this year. And he has great incentive to, you know, go to Liberty University. And I think it's great. It's a great, phenomenal school with great prestige and so on and so forth. Jerry Fowler, uh, Fowler, Jerry Falwell began that school about 40 or 50 years ago, 40 years ago. It's a great school. And so there's an incentive there. How many has ever met some, listen to me, everybody look, I'm, I'm talking to you tonight, it's very important that you get this. How many have met somebody that you knew in your heart that they're able to get through this, but they're not applying themselves? They're able to get through that problem. They have the mental, emotional, psychological equipment and prepared and are able to do it, but they just refuse to do it. They just won't get on board. They just won't apply themselves. And so Paul is saying here, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That power, that dunamis, that energy that God gives you. So in other words, we meet people all the time in life. That in my estimation, in my thinking, that little problem that they're going through should be a molehill compared to what really problems are in life. I mean, just a moment, but they won't apply themselves. They don't have an incentive. They're happy with status quo. They're happy. I had a guy sleeping yesterday uh, on our bench in front of the office. You know, I have that beautiful Charleston bench there. And I remember right on the back of the window, on the back of it says, uh, prayer and meditation bench. This guy took it a little too far and fell asleep. And so we have this guy, and he looked to be homeless and whatnot. But you see, and I, I begin to talk with him, but I see that there's, a, there's no incentive. No incentive. How do you know that if a person, for instance, says they're broke, they're hungry, and, <laughs> well, listen, I got some work in my backyard, and you might come, well, really bad on me. They don't have incentive. But hear me tonight. Jesus asked Peter, the disciples in fact, 
are you going to leave me too? After the seven, he left the number. Jesus said, are you going to leave me too? He said, Jesus, he said, Jesus said, where would you go? You have the words of spirit that are spiritual and spiritually applicable, and we can live with the spiritual insights of you as, and, the, and the words of life and spirit. Where are we going to go? There was an incentive for him to stay. Please get this. It's very important. It's not when things are going well that you need the strength of the Lord in your life. It's not when things are going well when your team is winning. It's when the chips are down, when your family is hurting, your household, when your job is on the line, when finances is more bills at the end of the month than money. So that's when really power and energy counts. That's where incentive must be surfaced. I have a reason to be strong in the Lord. I have a reason to keep on keeping on. I have an eternity, an eternity I'm facing right now. It, it, eternity is in front of me. And my current status with God is in play here. If this thing is unjust that God has allowed or disallowed to the whatever measure, if God was that unjust, then you start questioning, is it worth believing? Is it worth having faith? Is it worth exercising the strength and the energy? Is there an incentive to go forward? Or can I let myself go and become a dependent on, uh, become a, a state of the board, you know, a ward to the state or, or, or to the country, whatever it might be. We have to have an incentive to be strong in the Lord. Are you, are you, somebody understanding what I'm saying yes. tonight? Yes. We have too many Christians that are falling off by the wayside at the slightest crosswinds, and they're not able to stand in the evil day. They right. don't seem to have an incentive. There are two things that are at play here. Number one, if I have Christ in my heart in a real way, not in a Walt Disney fantasy world way, but in a real way, then I have I have uh, reason number one. I have incentive number one. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. My life that I live now is not for me, but my life that I live is for him. And if he's allowed this thing to come into my life, it is not to destroy me in order to push me away and to pull me away from faith, but rather to reinforce my commitment to walk with Jesus Christ. The whole thing, we have to have an incentive, my first incentive to serve him and to be faithful to my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to be faithful to him. My first loyalty is to him and, and my first incentive is that it justifies and validates my faith in him. Secondly, John in his epistle, chapter 3, said we love him because he first loved us. We love not only him, but we love. We ooze the love of God. In fact, this church, we don't have to pump anybody to go and hug somebody. We have to pull them off with a whip. And that's good. So, so John says, we love him. We love because he first loved us. The second incentive is love compels me to fight a good fight. Somebody help me. Why would I fight for my wife if not, if not because I love her? As weak as I am and with a, and another heart situation another extent, 10 days ago, somebody come across to get my wife. My life will be on the line before hers. I fight because I love. I fight for you as your pastor, because I love you. And I mean that with all my heart. Love is the greatest incentive. So when he says, finally, be strong in the Lord, you have to have a reason to be strong. We're just sweet, we're, we're prone to let ourselves go and to just submit to and give up to the situation and give it over where we don't know that must never happen to a true child of God you don't 
things strike you need to be strong in the Lord when things are going well. Who needs incentive when things are going well? I mean, you know, what can I tell you? That I'm not faced with any particular challenge right now. You've had challenges in your you've had challenges, we've all, we've all had our challenges in life. You've had challenges in your business test. Something says we've all had challenges. Diane, first 14 years she worked as a teacher. Grade five of English and math as she taught. There was great challenging years. Even prior to that, going to university, did her master's in plus 30, and all that kind of stuff. It, it, there were many times that she would let them get in the car and cry, exhausted, worn out, tired, come home, exhausted, worn out, tired. But something kept pushing her. She had her focus on the end product that she's enjoying today because she stood the test and was willing to pay the price. <clears throat> By the way, that's her maiden name, Christ. So this is a good Christ right here. And, and this Christ was right. <laughs> so, so what do we see here? 